Well, we know in Milwaukee they like to drink beer, but tomorrow they could be drinking champagne. You are Locked On MLB, your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. If you don't believe me, how could I have a lower third where I'm called Sully? I've been a baseball podcaster for a while now, and we're about to wrap up my sixth full season here at the Lockdown Podcast Network. And for the next couple of weeks, I'm also doing double duty. I do Lockdown MLB, and I host Lockdown A's. In this, what might be their final year in Oakland, although check out the show I'm dropping today. They may be staying in Oakland. Life is weird. Follow us at Lockdown MLB Pods on Twitter or on Instagram. I'm your pal, Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. And today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, hey, um, before we get started with the show here, um, let's go over the trivia question. Now, I asked the trivia question. I said, who was the first player to hit 20 home runs for two different teams in the same year? Well, Stephen Colaterra, who's an everyday listener, says the trivia question, David Justice in 2000. He's an everyday Sully, which means he listens every day. Stephen, you're right that David Justice did that, but he wasn't the first. He wasn't the first. So you didn't get it right, but I love your confidence there. Nope. Uh, Yuki Matsui Mets writes, the only Leo. Now, now you're not te- technically, Yuki, you're not right either, but you got the right name. The only player that had 20 home runs for two different teams the same year is Mark McGuire in 1997. He's not the only one. David Justice did, as we just mentioned. However, uh, Mark McGuire was the first one in the year, in what I like to call the calm before the storm in 1997, when he was traded in mid year or basically given to the St. Louis Cardinals in that uh, run to catch Maris um, that didn't quite work out. Um, and he was he was battling alongside Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, an interesting person, and so that that's the answer. Uh, the only person I could find who homered, who had at least two home runs for four different teams in the same year, and this is probably the single craziest year that a player ever had, was uh, Dave Kingman, and Dave Kingman could have been the strangest baseball player of all time. He was multiple all-stars uh, would be in the top 20 of the MVP count. He led the league at home runs twice uh, and didn't seem to excel at any other level of the game. Um, he had one legitimately excellent season and that was 1979. Most of the times he would have a low batting average, high strikeouts, low walks, but hit the snot out of the ball. And in 1977, he began the year with the New York Mets, where he hit nine home runs for the Mets. And then on the same day that the Mets traded away Tom Seaver to the Reds, Kingman got traded to the San Diego Padres, and he wound up hitting 11 home runs for the Padres. Well, at the end of the towards the end of the year, you know, Kingman, who was going to be a free agent, the Padres decided, well, we met, that's enough of that. They put him on waivers, and he was claimed in September by the Angels. And that he had a he had a few home runs for the Angels. And then in September, he was traded to the Yankees for the stretch run, where he had four home runs for the Yankees. So he hit home runs for the Mets, Padres, Angels, and Yankees in the same season. And when I got his baseball card the next year, it said Cubs because he signed with the Cubs. So he played within a calendar year. He homered for five different teams. That's weird. All right, uh, but enough about Dave Kingman. This is big, big time for, I don't even know if that's a sentence or not. 
But the Milwaukee Brewers, first things first, let's just award Pat Murphy manager of the year in the National League now. Pat Murphy took over a team that lost its big manager, that traded away its ace. Everyone thought they were going to rebuild. And not only have the Milwaukee Brewers been a staggeringly consistent ball club this whole season, not only have they been in first place uh, for the last – the first time they were in first place was uh, uh, mid-April. And save for a day or – save for like a couple of days where they were tied in early May, they haven't looked back. And they have not had a, a – they have not – their biggest lead was 11 and a half games a few weeks ago. They've not had a losing streak longer than three. They've not had a winning streak longer than six. They've been the models of consistency. And that consistency – oh, let me get rid of that banner there. That uh, consistency was shown – when they played the Philadelphia Phillies, even without Christian Yelich, the the Milwaukee Brewers with Contreras, with uh, uh, Joey Ortiz, who had some big, big hits, including a triple in the sixth. Uh, Savali pitched very well. And Colin Ray, who has been a solid pitch starter for them, but has been had a rocky road of it recently. They put him in the bullpen. And what did he do? He, reco- he pitched over the last two some odd innings and recorded the save. The Milwaukee Brewers have been absolutely super consistent all season long. And even though they did lose Christian Yelich and we're not sure what his situation is going to be, they're getting production from players. Willie Adamas, Reese Hoskins, William Contreras. Uh, They're getting Jackson Trio has been worth every penny, you know, um, and, and, of course, their pitching staff with Peralta. Ray's been sent to the bullpen. Fine. McGill, Koenig, uh, and Devin Williams, Frankie Montas. This is a deep team. May not be star-studded, but they're deep. And if they beat the Philadelphia Phillies tomorrow and the Oakland A's, who got clubbed by the Cubs, but if the A's can defeat the Cubs – and the Brewers can defeat the Phillies, guess what? The Milwaukee Brewers will be the National League Central champions with a couple of weeks to go. And they can rest people if they want, or they can make a run to make sure they get a a bye. Or maybe they don't care about the bye because the bye hasn't really helped their National League teams anyway. Do not sleep on the Milwaukee Brewers for winning the potentially winning the National League pennant. And they can get their proverbial ducks in a row. And they've been playing solid baseball and, frankly, a underappreciated level of baseball. They've been taking on teams, good, solid teams, and walking away with wins. Just take a look at what they've done. Okay, they, they lost that weird game on Sunday where it was 11 to 10 in extra innings to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Fine. They won against the Phillies today. They won that series against Arizona. They won the series against San Francisco. And they wound up, you know, their their record is, um, you know, they had a 19-9 and nine August, which they basically put the AF thrusters on. You know, they're 700 in, they're, they're 500 in September, but they're getting the job done. And they have depth. They have answers at every position. Do not be stunned because we've seen the Phillies stub their toe. Hell, they stubbed their toe tonight. We've seen Los Angeles be in situations where we don't know what their pitching staff is. We've seen that tonight. The Mets have looked great sometimes, but there's a possibility they could miss the playoffs altogether. There's one other team that looks super terrific right now heading into the National League playoffs. But I'm not saying the Brewers are a lock. I'm just saying don't sleep on them. Don't sleep on them because they're the exact kind of team like all the other recent National League pennants that could come in and get to the World Series. Step one, win the division. They can do that in the next 24 hours. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. 
Price Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps on Price Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Price Picks with a little as four correct picks. Say that three times fast. Price Picks is the best way to get on action on sports in most states, including Texas, Georgia, and right here in California. And Price Picks puts their members first, so all withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. When my picks hit, I can get my money in as quick as 15 minutes. Price Picks invented the flex play, which means you can still cash out if your lineup isn't perfect. You can double your money, even if one of your picks doesn't hit. Download the Price Picks app today. Use code LOCKEDONMLB. Get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code LOCKEDONMLB on Price Picks. You get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to get the bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize picks run your game. By the way, the team that is currently at full strength right now and should be scaring the tar out of everyone are the San Diego Padres. The Padres won three to one against the Houston Astros in what could very well be a World Series matchup. You heard me right. The Padres could do it because. Everyone's there now. All the players are back. And you got to see um, Arietta strike out for the first time at like 150 at-bats or something, banana boats like that. But you have Arietta. I mean, you have, not, uh, she's not Arietta. Arise. I'm sorry. Why am I thinking of Arietta? Arise struck out for the first time like 145 at-bats or something crazy like that. Forgive me. It's late. Uh, Profar, unbelievable. He's just terrific. He wound up getting another four-hit game. Machado, Merrill, Bogarts, Cronenworth, Tatis Jr., Arise. I can't believe I called him Marietta. You know, throw the tomatoes at me. And you Darvish is back. That's like making an acquisition. You Darvish is back. And with that, the Padres won, beating the Houston Astros. The Padres are an 86-win team. The Padres look stronger than the Dodgers right now, at least in terms of a pitching staff. Now, give the Dodgers some credit. The Dodgers wound up beating up the Atlanta Braves 9-0. Think of, they've, they've outscored them 17 to nothing since the eighth inning of yesterday's game. 9-0, that's what happens when you get a forfeit. You know, the, the Braves just may not have showed up. So the Dodgers are going to win 90 games, so they just need to win one more. But the Padres, who are right behind them, and are playing terrific baseball, are super solid all the way through. And I, if I'm the Dodgers, I'm a little nervous. If I'm the Dodgers, I'm a tiny bit nervous because of their pitching situation. Now, Yamamoto pitched very well. Bueller pitched well the other day. And Flaherty, who pitched badly his last game, but um, has shown talent, you know, you maybe you could cobble something together. Who knows? Maybe you throw Otani. I mean, at this point, that's not even ceremonial. They may, they may just say, hey, can you throw a couple innings for us, for Christ's sakes? We may need you. But the National League wildcard chase is absolutely banana boats right now. And a big reason why, beyond the fact that the, um, that the Padres wound up winning that game and have taken real control over the top wildcard spot, and they right now, they're up by a couple of games with only about a dozen to play for that final wildcard spot. But the Diamondbacks lost a stupid game in Colorado. They were setting up a, a, a double play in the ninth inning. They threw the ball away, allowing the Rockies to walk off. And the Mets, whose bats were completely dead, they couldn't score a run until the eighth inning. But the problem for the Washington Nationals was they couldn't, they couldn't do anything either. And Starling Marte wound up getting a walk-off hit. That mixed up with the fact that the Braves forgot to sh forgot that the Monday game was taking place and got absolutely whumped by the Dodgers. Right now means the Braves are on the outside looking in, and the Diamondbacks are only one game ahead of the Mets. The Mets could tie the Diamondbacks tomorrow. There is a possibility the Diamondbacks could miss the playoffs if the Braves get their act together. And the Diamondbacks continue this nice slide. Now, we're not 100% sure what's happening with Francisco Lindor. But 
uh, Acuna, who was picked up at the deals last, uh, um, you know, last trade deadline by the Mets, has filled in, and who knows, he could fill in nicely. The Diamondbacks are continuing their series against the Rocks, which we show is not as easy as we thought that was going to be. Uh, the Braves have dusted themselves off, and they will be. But where the hell are they playing? Oh, they're playing the Reds. Who knows what's going to happen there? The Reds are a very confusing team. While the Mets and the Nats are going to continue to play with McGill pitching against Parker. The National League wildcard race could be an absolute mess if a couple of these things come together. By the way, the one the probably the weirdest and wildest game took place. Well, a couple of wild games took place. One of them took place in Cleveland, where the Twins had absolute control of the game right up until the seventh inning, their 3-1 lead. The, the Guardians started pecking back, and then in the um, in the bottom of the eighth inning, Kyle Amenzardo hit a two-run home run, and then that, uh, that gave Cleveland the lead, hand the ball to Class A, he, that's automatic. Class A's ERA is now at 0. 0.65, and Cleveland's uh, march to the magic number is now at seven. But the other game to be taken note on was between the Tigers and the Royals. And in the third inning, the Royals took advantage of an absolutely bizarre strike zone to load the bases. Bobby Wood Jr. came up, hit a grand slam, and everyone in Detroit started to deflate until the Tigers started chipping back. Sweeney drove in a run, and then Verling drove in a run, and then Colt Keith hit a home run to give the uh, to cut it to within one, and then uh, Perez got a pinch hit double, and Verling got a single, and next thing you know, the Tigers were up seven six against KC. Now combine the KC right now, who by the way. Give KC some credit. They have a winning record. With KC, KC's probably going to make one of the wildcard spots. So they're up by two and a half games with about 10 games to go or with 11 games to go. That's really tough to make up all those games. But with Minnesota's loss, and they're three and seven in their last 10 games, and with Detroit's win, they're seven and three, right now the Tigers are only a game and a half out of the playoffs. And mind you, Seattle is only two. If Minnesota continues to slide, if Minnesota loses again to Cleveland, and Cleveland wants to not only clinch, but get that top spot in the American League, if Minnesota just loses a couple more games and the Tigers win a couple more, the Tigers could make the playoffs. So could Seattle. What I'm saying is there is a combination in these final 11, 12 games for what I always love at this time of the year. And that is complete anarchy. You don't know who's winning when, you know who's winning why. But all I know is I want to look up and go, oh my God, this doesn't even make sense anymore. Because I want that final weekend. I want that final weekend of the year to have a bunch of teams not trying to position for who's going to clinch the this and who's going to be the wild card and who's going to have home field. I want someone saying, we're either winning or we're going home. We're either making the playoffs with this win or we're playing golf. That's what I want. I want anarchy, and I don't think I'm asking for too much. You've heard us talk about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Oh, we have something a little different from you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every single regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com and download America's number one sports book. Thanks so much for making Locked On MLB your first listen. For your second listen, try Locked On A's. It's also part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Now, why would you listen to Locked On A's if you're not an A's fan? 
because first of all, it's hosted by me, your pal Sully. Secondly, this is going to be a strange couple of weeks where we're going to be seeing the A's playing their final games in Oakland, maybe, and seeing the outpouring of love and frustration as the East Bay says goodbye, maybe, to their green and gold. I will be at the last, maybe, game at the Oakland Coliseum. I'll sort of be at the last game for this year. And they've been a fun team. Save for that awful two-month stretch, they've actually been playing winning baseball and having a lot of fun along the way. So check out Locked On A's. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Um, baseball has the illusion of the past, present, and future all happening simultaneously. And I've talked about that many times. But every once in a while, you get a stark reminder that time is undefeated. And sometimes we are, we realize that, well, no, no, reality happens and things change. And the timelessness of baseball has to face a cruel reality. And with that, I got a little emotional when I saw that Joe Castiglione was stepping away. The, the Ford Frick Award winning Hall of Fame announcer for the Red Sox is walking away from the Red Sox announcing booth. Let me put this into perspective. Um, Joe Castiglione has been in the Red Sox announcing booth since 1983. In 1983, I was 11 years old and listening to just about every Red Sox game that year. Now, he was the second banana to Ken Coleman at the time. And I have to say, Ken Coleman was the announcer for the Red Sox for a long time. He was never my favorite. Growing up in the suburbs of Boston, Ken Coleman was never my favorite. I was a Ned Martin guy. I loved Ned Martin. I thought Ned Martin was great. But when I hear Ken Coleman's voice, I do think of the Red Sox and the radio. And Joe Castiglione was his partner. And over the years, with several different partners along the way, Joe Castiglione, who was from Connecticut, born in Connecticut, like me, was that companion for ups and downs. Morgan Magic, Mo Vaughn, the rise of Pedro, the rise of Nomar, the frustration of 99 and 03, and of course the euphoria of 04, 07, 13, and 18. Can you believe it was his call when the final out was made? And I love that because it was sincere. It didn't feel canned. It didn't feel scripted. He was a New England voice. He sounded like someone you would know. I mean, I grew up with a, you know, with a lot of Irish and Italian people in New England. I am Irish and Italian, and I grew up in New England. I heard lots of voices like his, and he got excited when things happened to the Red Sox, and you could always tell when something bad happened because there was that disappointing voice. That's ah, a pop-up. Jeter's going to catch it. It was like listening to a game with someone you would see at Papa Gino's. And that friendship that's in the booth is so important. It's strange that John Sterling says goodbye to the Yankees the same year Joe Castiglione says goodbye to the Red Sox because for generations, whether you are a fan of Sterling or Castiglione, I happen to like both of them, that they're going to be gone, and that friend that you watch the game with is gone too. There is a connection that Joe Castiglione has, at least with me emotionally, and I think with Red Sox fans as well. Kind of like how Vince Scully was a last connective tissue to the Brooklyn Dodgers all those years when he was announcing in Los Angeles. Castiglione, starting in 83, is it that's an important year for the Red Sox. And I know that sounds strange because the Red Sox did not contend that year. They actually had a pretty lousy season that year. But it was the final year of Carl Yastrzemski's career. And while there's been a lot of revisionist history about Boston fandom and the importance of this and the importance of that, what we now recognize as Red Sox fandom and Red Sox nation and love of Fenway Park and all that stuff does not go back to 
Ted Williams and Johnny Pesky and all that. It goes to Yastrzemski. Fenway Park was going to be demolished. When Ted Williams retired in 1960 through 1966, the Red Sox were not contenders. Their attendance was terrible. And there was a huge outcry to build an all-purpose domed stadium in Boston for the struggling Boston Patriots, that's what they were called then, and the Red Sox who couldn't draw flies at Fenway Park. The Yorkies were threatening to move the Red Sox if they didn't get a new stadium. And then 1967 came around. And 67 was the greatest pennant race of all time. Talk about anarchy. Look that up. And the big hero was Carl Yastrzemski, who won the Triple Crown that year and led the Red Sox to the first World Series since 1946 and only their second World Series since 1918. And while they lost the World Series that year, all of New England fell in love with Fenway Park. And suddenly the park that was a liability suddenly became an asset. And Fenway Park became part of the Boston culture and Red Sox Nation was essentially born that year. And Yastrzemski stayed with the Red Sox through 83. And Joe Castiglione was the announcer in 1983. He announced games played by Yastrzemski. And he's been there so long that Yastrzemski's grandson homered in Fenway Park when the San Francisco Giants showed up. That's a long stretch. And that's a connective tissue. Castiglione's voice announced the player whose deeds essentially saved Fenway Park. Can you believe it? Now, there have been other announcers. I think Sean McDonough is one of the absolute greatest announcers. I think he's one of the best baseball announcers I've ever heard in my life, period. Listen to his calls in the 1992 and 1993 World Series, if you don't believe me. But he's wonderful. Dave O'Brien is great. Obviously, they you know we lost Jerry Remy not too long ago, and you know they've been they've made their they've made some bad bad decisions in terms of how they treat some of their their announcers. Of course, you know not every time the Red Sox have not always made the uh, best choices, and sometimes you know you look up and you go like you know why isn't Don Orsillo going to be the announcer for the Red Sox and perpetuity. I get it. But you're going to lose a friend, even if you're not a Red Sox fan. I'm not a Yankee fan by any stretch of the imagination. But those friends are there. You know, the way Ken Korak is with the A's, the way that John Miller and Crook and Kipe are with the Giants. You know, they're the friends. They're the people who've been there a while. They're the people you watch the games with. And Joe Castiglione is that voice that I listened to back in Massachusetts. Same year, Return of the Jedi came out. And Carl Yastrzemski was playing his final game. And a fifth and sixth grader, who called himself Sully, would listen to games while raking the leaves outside. And one of those voices was Joe Castiglione, who, unbeknownst to me, was going to call four World Series championships, which, no, Joe, I can't believe it. Let me just throw out the trivia question for today. When Joe Castiglione was first paired in the Red Sox booth, it was with Ken Coleman. When Ken Coleman retired, who was the Red Sox announcer who replaced Ken Coleman and was paired with Joe Castiglione. Put that down. Put that down in the YouTube comments or wherever. So follow us at Locked on MLB Pods on Twitter or on Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter. Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Talking about the Brewers, Tigers, Diamondbacks, Mets, and the great Joe Castiglione. This has been Locked on MLB. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. <laughs>